We also know that in defining things, if you don't begin at the beginning, it's very hard to reach the same conclusion. So I want to start with a subject that everyone should know about, man. Women love men sometimes. Men love men sometimes. And everybody knows about man in general. But I start usually at the beginning. And in so doing, I looked up a little bit about man again, and it simply said that man is an adult male human being. It also said then that a boy is a male child before he becomes a man. And then it was interesting, I found that at one time the word girl really meant boy. And that was among what they call Anglo-Saxon people as they were beginning to define their gender. The word girl actually meant boy at one time. I then looked up the word patriarch and it said it means a father or the male head of a family or a tribe. And of course it gave examples and in the Christian Bible I simply use that because this is where a lot of my people seem to point their references again. It stated that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were examples of patriarchs. I appreciate that. We presently live in and for some time have lived under what we call a patriarchal or male ruled society. Most of the presidents of the country in which we serve have been male and most of these things have been run by males. Maybe that's why it's in the condition it's in. The Bible says, and again I'm going back to the book that most of us feel we understand probably better than other books. Whether we do or not, we'll have to actually see. And it says that Adam was the first man, and that the Lord God created what he placed under him, which was called Adam. He said that Adam was put in a seemingly tropical paradise, and because he might become lonely, he made for him other animals. And then finally, a helpmeet, who was known as woman. Now, because of this emphasis on man by the Lord God, many religious and also uh, nations, again, throughout this planet, venerate man. They also say that the church has specific interest in the divine right of man because he was said to be the ruler of all things and said to dominate all things that were made for him put under his jurisdiction. But something's happened in our society. In our world today, there is much debate whether that something is good or that something is bad. Suddenly, there is what we call a male man and instead we now have a male person or a letter carrier. Instead of the chairman, we have a chair person. Instead of a congressman, we have a what? A representative or a congressperson. Mankind is now human being. Policeman is an officer of the law and so on and so forth it goes. This is so that one gender does not then feel disrespected by the other gender. The male and female supposedly now are equal and therefore have the equal rights which supposedly they had anyway. We have homosexuality and lesbians hitting man below his sexual belt and in fact threatening his very masculinity. We have drugs that are turning man into a weakling. We also have stress that's turning him into a nervous wreck and poor food intakes again and turning him into a very unfertile, very impotent, very frustrated shell of his former self. We're finding that man now dies much earlier than woman. That man again seems to get diseases faster than woman. That he's more subject to heart attacks, more subject to ulcers and to diabetes, to hair loss, and again to many of the ravages of old age which it shows on a man faster than it does now on a woman. So the question must finally be raised, can man in his present state actually uh, survive? 
Now, outside of that, when we look at the black man, in addition to all of those stresses, now must come the stress of a society which in the main is quite male dominated and oppresses the black male at every turn. We could go into a long lecture here about male-female relationships and about white man, yellow man, brown man, and black man relationships, but I want to move past all of that. This may come up down the line as we hopefully meet together through the year, per se. But I want to go back and take a look at the book and a passage from that book that made man supposedly the dominant creature on earth and what it was said, but I want to look at it from a metaphysical point of view. I want to kind of tear it apart a little bit, maybe being a little bit sacrilegious if necessary, but still trying to keep the text involved to see if we can maybe look at this thing and reach a different conclusion. In Genesis, the first chapter, 26 verse, God is made to say, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over, and it goes on to say the various creatures that fly and crawl and so on again like this. In Genesis, the 26th verse, it says again, so God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him, male and female. Now, what do we have here? We have a God creating a male and a female at the same time and calling them mutually man. Later, a Lord God created another man and called him Adam. And this is where the trouble really begins to start and what the modern theologists and preferably the theosophists are calling the second creation or the second Adam or what I like to colloquially call Adam II. The Hebrew word for Adam means red clay when literally translated. It shows that Adamic man was formed physically from earth-found ingredients and was somewhat red in appearance. The Hebrew word Yahweh was interpreted by these scholars as Lord God. This was taken from what is called the Tetragrammaton YVHV or Yad Hevathe. The Hebrew word Yehovah was interpreted again as God and Jehovah or Yehovah simply meant past, present, and future. Now this was done by what they call the scholars who were known as the Masorites or the writer scribes again. These were supposedly as we understand now Hebrew scholars and scribes interpreting what is called oriental philosophy for which was called now the chosen or chosen people which were there and for to come. So this was like a study guide for these so-called chosen by the scribes which were born before them. These Masoretes wrote what was called the Masoretic text of that chapter in that book literally was a universally created self-contained parthenogenic person hopefully of higher consciousness that God created that was called man. Parthenogenic simply means dual sexed, able to reproduce self without the aid of sperm and egg. It means a self-contained individual which obviously was either a very higher vibrating person at this time or pretty much we might say parthenogenic things were being placed on earth at that time which we don't find now. How many have ever heard of the Parthenon? The building called the Parthenon. Okay, the Parthenon in Greece is said to have been built by the Greeks. I doubt that very seriously. And it deals with what we would now call again a place where Parthenon and Parthenogenesis was practiced. They would go there at certain times of the year. They would have certain foods and fastings that they went through. They would avoid moonlight for a while or sunlight for a while, depending again on who was there and who was going to be placed at or in the Parthenon. Partially this creation by God and then this second creation by the Lord God 
had the ability to reproduce itself as a god possibly should. This was changed. This was uh, this fallen person now no longer could do this and was polarized, making the divine principle of life separate in two distinct bodies, which under parthenogenesis, it had been one body containing both sexual attributes. Now these two separations were called male and female, and the new and lesser creature was now called Hugh man now called Hugh man I now quote again going back to the biblical scholars in Genesis first and second chapter and it came to pass this means obviously after some time it passed when man began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took of them wives of all which they chose and there was born to them mighty men and there were giants in the earth. Now what do we have here? If there's any logic that can be made out of those phrases in the Bible, obviously a primordial race of people, mainly man, born of God, came in unto men who had produced offsprings that were not like them and since the sons of God had no women with them had left their women folk home and no women were amongst them they then went amongst these people that were called created humans took the women made love to the women and there were born to them something that was part man and something that was part God if you would it was a different type of an offspring. Since again these earth women were different from the sons of God that came in unto them, many of them in bearing these children suffered mightily and also wondered at what kind of creation was now coming out of their womb. It was interesting that seemingly the first production here, as we'll get more into that tomorrow afternoon, were all females. And later on, some males were born, and because they were, shall we say, scarce, they actually had to fight their way into the earth, and they had to fight hard to repropagate their kind. They even had to result to what was called circumcision. Not making sense yet? It will. It is now found that a male has reproductive organs called phallus or penix, prostate, testes, and scrotum. The female has reproductive organs called clitoris and ovaries, uterus, and womb. And sometimes has been referred as, to as womb man. We find that the female fallopian tubes will be named after a guy named Fallopius in 1523, resembles very closely the male vas deferens. And the male prostate gland resembles very much an atrophied or shrunken female womb or uterus. Every male has the rudimentary mammary glands of the female and at times can actually produce milk and if necessary, as some of the African tribes were shown to, can even suckle a child, per se. We also find that the, what is called bobo urethra glands, for any of you doing in the pre-med or looking up again, per se, if you're nurses or doctors again, that those glands of the male are equal to the larger so-called vestibular glands in woman herself. When we look even further, we begin to see some really way out but interesting things which show that at one time there might have been a throwback here, that everything was not cut and dry as the sexes are now, everybody didn't look alike, and something also went on on this planet that they've tried to hide or seemingly have tried to mix people up in thinking that everybody is the same and the big difference between male and female is great. It may not be as great as we think. We understand that the prostate gland is something that the male has that the female does not have. I looked up the word prostate and I find it means literally to stand in front of, to stand in front of.
to stand in front of prostate. When I look up the word prostrate, which many people kind of confuse the two, it means to lie flat with the head down. You prostrate yourself on the ground or gymniflect. It has nothing to do with prostate, which means again to stand in front of or something that stands in front of something. We find that the prostate seems to stand in front of the male urethra duct and gland, which is in front of the bladder. And most men have some kind of prostate trouble sometime in their life, usually after 40, some of them before, especially if they're alcoholics or heavy into drugs. The question is, why? And what does this have to do with the separation, supposedly, of the sexes? And what am I still driving at? Stay with me. It's going to get even more interesting. We find now that in some cases of giganticism and dwarfism, the female clitoris resembles very much the male what? Penis. If you've seen some of these pictures of anomalies, we see the pictures supposedly of the freaks of Earth, per se. We find again that the glands are so close together, the organs are so close together, that they almost double in their function. We also know, too, that some men have a large foreskin over their phallic symbols, or penises again, that have to be cut back by medical doctors, or as in Africa, amongst the Ndombis again, amongst the Hausa people, some of these in Fulani, it is actually done as a ritual of life by groups of males before the child reaches puberty, which is a very harsh thing, and near birth if possible. I'm suggesting to you that the reason why this foreskin grows so much and the reason why these old Hebrews went through such trouble to give circumcision was because at one time on earth, since the males had a very hard time making it into life as males, as we'll find out, all original zygotes are females and have to change to males or there would be no males on earth, we find that this is simply, again, the covering like it would be over the clitoris that has produced itself in males itself, and especially some time ago, it had to constantly be cut back or it would cease to grow and try to cover the penis. It would begin to grow to such an extent that it seemed, again, like a deformity. It shows again that nature actually fought against man's entrance on earth and his reproduction was almost nil. All he could do would be to find if he was one of the ones that was successful in coming into life, he tried to maintain his own sexuality through a lot of difficulty. A whole rite had to be performed to continue to circumcise those males that were strong enough to make entrance to the earth plane. We also find that the rib cage of man and female is different. We find again that the rib cage, of course, encases the lungs, and that the lungs usually in a male are larger than those of a female. The lungs do this one thing in the main. They exchange oxygen and give up carbon dioxide and carbon, uh, all of the different poisons in the body and allow the body to breathe by the capacity of the lungs and the quality of the oxygen being osmosed into the blood, do you have the individual growing either stronger or weaker, more psychic or less psychic? So the lungs have a large part to do with the quality of life and the kind of energy that flows through the male or the female. Since this is a man lecture, we're going to say simply this. The energy that is exchanged from the blood that gives us life, which we call oxygen, at one time was very, very strong. The energy was such that the brain cells actually almost vibrated from the kind of pure oxygen that was on Earth and it was coming into man himself. Then as Earth became more polluted and as the energy fields of Earth began to get less vibrant, the oxygen capacity and the energy in the oxygen also depleted and man lost the power to do a lot of things seemingly that he could do before. The energy simply was not there. The energy was not in the corpuscles of the red blood cells. The energy was not in the oxygen and the oxygen began to be weaker. And therefore man began to be weaker as a consequence. Most men 
who are from the sons of God, that paraphrase again in the Bible, have a very interesting gland that science does not talk about, that the physiologists do not talk about. Some men have discovered it, others have not. Some sciences have taught man to use this gland, but very few Western sciences even deal with it anymore. Some of you may already know, some of you may not know, and some of you may learn something a little bit different tonight. If the men in the audience that I see here, without hurting yourself, will simply take the top or the tip of your tongue and try to put it up near the roof of your mouth. Now the females can do it too, but you're not going to find there what the men will find there. You will find, first of all, a very ticklish little area. It's a little mantle with little ridges. It's very sensitive. And then a pithy area near the back of the mouth. Now some of you will notice that that pithy area can do strange things. If you eat too fast and you get a pea or a corn or something like that, it can actually come up through that pithy area and wind up coming up out of your nose or actually stop up your windpipe. How many have ever found things that go the wrong way? Oh, come on, I know some of you, everybody's gone through that one. All right, be honest with me here. It's a small group. Come on. Now, that means that there is a connecting passage where, there. And it can either go down, and hopefully the esophagus closes as it goes down uh, the, uh, the trachea, per se, again, and goes down into the digestive system. But every once in a while, it goes the wrong way, and we can see that there's another interconnecting passage there. Well, just ahead of that pithy center, you will find a little mound or a ridge and right up underneath it there is a little crevice or opening or hole in the roof of your mouth. Now take your time and kind of explore. First you get to the little ticklish area, the mantle, but between that area and that you'll see a little mound and you may feel a little depression. In some cases it's never been used, it's pretty com almost completely closed and others are still kind of open. Just the men now that say the females, you're blessed or you're cursed, I don't know which, you don't have that. Now with the men, how many have found that little mound or how many already knew it was there in the first place? Let me just see your hands. Just one person, two, three, four. How many ever can find the little depression or maybe even an open hole that's there? Can't see for this big light on me here. Uh, okay, no, no one at all. One person. Two people. Well, have some fun with your own body this evening. When you go home, check that out, that little mound underneath check and see the little opening or depression that's there and understand that all men on earth do not have that. Some men on earth do have it. Very few, if any, women have it at all. It is one of the things that mark the separation of the sexes. And a lot of double talk has been made about that hill, that mount, that depression, and that tunnel that leads up into the skull directly from the mouth. This is why many sons of God who take in a lot of cow products and mucus making products wonder why in the world they suffer so greatly while others eat all kind of cow products and don't. That is one of the reasons that your doctors and scientists do not tell you because if enough things get in that passageway it will begin to hurt. It will also begin to stop you up and you'll get one of the biggest head colds you've ever seen in your life. It is not coming from just mucus that's taken into the system. It's coming from that little drainage that goes down that passageway, especially from the sons of God. That passageway was to be kept open. And a lot of instructions have gone about, a lot of edifices, a lot of buildings and huge monuments have been built to that one miracle that was left as a sign for the sons of God so they would know who they were and also know what they should do to ascend. Many of the Oriental masters who took the ancient teachings understood this and worked with it in various forms of Chinese, Japanese, and Oriental arts. Many of the Africans, I guess also with the Zulu and with the, again, the Hausa people, and against, of course, the famous Yoruba people. The Yoruba also knew and taught of this science. What that particular thing is, is reflected very much in what is called the Great Pyramid. The Pyramid at Giza on the plateau there, in which we falsely call the Sahara Desert. That was not the desert it was built on. In other lectures I explained why that does make a big difference. It was a very interesting piece of land that now has been surrounded by the Sahara, 
and now they consider it having been a Sahara. It was not. It was a very key piece of land there, which some of these ancient people, these Lord gods, if you would, chose to build a huge city. And on top, one of the highest parts of the city was what we now call the Great Pyramid of Giza, who again, Western man teaches you as Cheops, but we know was actually supposed to be whose temple? Khufu, all right? If you will take a look at what is called the King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid, and those four slabs of stone that rise above the King's Chamber, I don't have a blackboard, but in a parapet like four actually slabs, and then above it is a whole little uh, room like built. They state that this is where the body of the king was to be placed upon his depth, and that's why they built the pyramids. I state to you concretely, the pyramids were never built as an entombment for anybody. It definitely wasn't built for Khufu, and certainly was not built for Cheops. Had nothing to do with any of that, but as a people degenerate and ignorant do not understand what they see, they make up fallacies, and since the books are read as textbooks by us, we fall victim to the same lies and misinterpretation through ignorance. That pyramid structure was to resemble the skull of the sons of God and to teach them that once they could understand this, they could then rise to the idea of the other edifice that they put out in front of it, which runs 240 feet, weighs something like 600 million tons, and is carved out of a solid pleat of granite called the Sphinx. Mark my words, you're going to hear more and more talk about the Sphinx this year and through 96 than you ever had. And by 95 and 96, it's going to start giving off vibrations. Just as man's skull that is the son of God will start giving off vibrations. When it gives off vibrations, the skull of man the real man, the sons of God, will also start giving off vibrations. And when that tunnel to the Grand Gallery also opens as the stone falls away, so will the tunnel leading to the pineal gland within the sons of God open, and the powers will begin to run through him once more. Everything here was a symbol for those who were dead to finally awaken. That's when the pyramid became the tomb. It was never built as a tomb, but when those rightful users of the tomb fell in ignorance into necromancy or death-like knells, lost in consciousness, and the planetary vibrations also shrunk, then all that was was an entombment. The soul of man was lost in the skull of an animal, for he could not awaken and quicken to the vibrations that came from his bloodline and was no more than the dumb beast of earth, who some people were told to subdue. Not all people were told to subdue. To make this even more simpler, or to get even more complex, we have collectively on the earth what we call five races of man. There are not five races of man. We have collectively on earth seven continents by which this man may exist. There are not seven continents on earth. And we have collectively again the colors black, brown, yellow, white and pink by which the races of man are colored. There were also green, blue, and red men on earth and we've forgotten about that. The only one we hear referred to as a red man now is so-called Native American, which we call misnomered the Indian. Our planet has come under a period of ignorance, dumbness, and lowered vibration and that time is now to move. It is past. There is no reason for ignorance, dumbness, or lowered vibration if you want, and if you happen to be of the sons of the God and you don't respond to it, you will soon be dead. Now, isn't that a big threat? I'm not making the threat. I'm interpreting new and future knowledge. As a metaphysician is supposed to, you have to find out whether you can agree with it or not. There is no truth until you decide what truth is, and each person should find that truth out for his or herself. Hugh man, by which if you look in the encyclopedias and dictionary, it says we're all human beings. That's a lie. We are not all human beings. Hugh man is animal man. Hugh was a god Hugh, which roared the lower planes again, 
under the old teaching of the ancient Sudanese and, Nub and Nubian people and later on the so-called Egyptian people, which was a mixed race. You're going to find out just how mixed in a minute. Human did not come from God or what we call the Creator, but from lords or what we now call the Lord God and animals. They were a creation by scientists who we now refer to as Lord Gods. And they made human by engrafting and changing the animal life at different times as they found it on this planet and from other planets and dropped them off here. God man, this is the key and the ones that had the key to the Sphinx and the pyramid, were from the sons of gods or which we now refer to as the angels. And they were a cross between mankind and the sons of gods or the angels. Understand this, in fundamentalist teachings, angels are those spirits who represent the Most High and who fly around with wings and live where this in Herod or some of the lower heavens and do the biddings of God himself. That is a fundamentalist interpretation I do not decry a religion, I do not argue religion, I say that is only one interpretation of an angel. The other is those who mastered the angles, those who could bend light rays, those who understood the four pillars of the sacred sign of the swastika, which was not called the swastika, but a whole different name. It mastered those who understood the four rays of consciousness necessary to exist on the fourth dimension, which Earth was supposed to have been into millions of years ago, but got held back by humans. Now, as humans are we going to begin to die out and the sons of God must come to the fore so the angels can return, that awakened person is the one that will now go through changes like you have not seen as he attempts to throw off the dross, the animal, and come into his own consciousness. Mankind came from the lords of different planets and was soulless and could not reproduce. I repeat the three. Human, animal man, made from animal species both on this planet and other planets. God man the sons of God, and also sometimes interpreting with mankind, a made person again by Lord gods on other planets. And mankind again by strictly the lords of other planets in this one. Obviously, you can begin to see what I'm inferring. This has nothing to do with the creator, the prime causation, the cosmic universal logoi. This has to do with people who evolve up the ladder and because of their knowledge of genetics, their knowledge of geography, their knowledge of astronomy, I'm sorry, astrology, their knowledge of astrophysics, when they come to a planet, you treat them like gods. All of the series that you see now, Babylon 5, Deep Space 9, and all the rest of it, are trying to show you what really may exist in this system and in other systems to let you come into what is now called the planetary brotherhood. To awaken from the idea that you are a lone important species, you are not. But now the earth is becoming an important place as we'll find out for numbers of reasons over this weekend as we get deeper even tomorrow than we're going to go tonight. This is to awaken those who are not soulless but have deep spiritual souls. One of the things that black people have found consistently is that in the face of adversity, they sing. In the face of adversity, they can laugh. In the face of adversity, they come together as a unit. And one thing seems to bother them. They know that they're supposed to worship something. They know that they're supposed to be spiritual entities, but they're not finding the results sometimes strong enough. They have found that in following religions fervently enough, really getting on fire with it, miracles do happen. But down deep, they're not satisfied because they still feel there ought to be a shortcut, and they know that something's there, but it's just not quite right, and daggone it, it frustrates me no end. How many have actually felt like that? Don't lie, if you haven't, you haven't. 
Most of you do. That's why the church is now, the people are going to the strongest word, the best choir, and the best place where they can also make money and meet good mates. And they're falling away from little churches that just can't make it anymore. Fundamentalism is separating from the advanced spiritual person. Again, I say this, and don't say I came here and talked about the churches and put them down. I'm not. Let each person go to any church they choose. It is their choosing. They will be responsible for their own souls if they have one. I'm saying that there's a difference between a spiritual person and a religious person. A spiritual person does not need a church for the home and temple of God that they find their souls in is the church and how they keep it clean and how they keep it out of ignorance and what they do with it shows their manifestation of the God life. For the other, they need a religious fervor and constantly reminded because they do not have quite the soul that is risen to the point where they can again manifest the creator within them. So they constantly have to remind themselves as a herd come together to give themselves the strength to carry on. That is changing. That's why you're going to find the church being attacked like never before and leaders in false churches falling like never before and that's why the fall wells and all the rest of it and you find them like little animals attacking each other, each one pulling each other down and the congregation suffering from it. Because man must learn he does not have to go to a church, he is the church. The temple of the living God is not just a folklore or a little thing that is said. The skull that you have when properly understood is a temple. It is so full of potential power and glandular interest there that the best way that the ancients could show it was to build a pyramid and say that that is the skull of man and then show him the difference between the sphinx and the others that walk the life. Why is it you think that when Napoleon and the grenadiers came out onto the Giza Plateau and they saw the Sphinx looking Negroid in all of its glory. They went crazy and blew the nose off by sending 19 shot rounds into the nose and then coming back and climbing it and pickaxing at the nose and now they act like they don't know what the Sphinx looked, it used to look like. Why they don't, I don't know. They drew pictures of it and they saw what it looked like. It was a Negroid looking person looking outward, eastward. And it showed again that in front of this big pyramid, they put this skull and this animal. Three of the secrets of this pyramid, and there are eight, I'm sorry, there's seven secrets of the pyramid. Three of them is that the head of the man on the Sphinx and the body of the animal simply shows that if you notice there's wings on the Sphinx, there's scales on the Sphinx, there was a tail on the Sphinx, there were claws and hooves. It shows that everything that moved crawled or flew on earth was subjugated, subjugated or, domin or was dominated by the chief creature of earth, the son of God, the man's head. But everything on that man's body of the Sphinx needs those other things to survive until which time its consciousness rises enough and can outgrow them. It can eat fish, it can eat anything that moves and crawls, snails and everything else. It can breathe in air and live very well on that air if you would. I appreciate that very much. And live on that air if you would. It can do more things by adapting under different vibrations. It can consume everything on earth and live on it. Even to the herbs and the berries if it goes up that far. Once this is understood, then you understand again that it was that the animal portion of man was located in what is called the primal urge, the lower chakra, the animal brain, which is located just below the navel and connected to one of the units of the spine. Now what am I talking about the animal brain? You've only got one brain, it's got its different lobes, it's two hemispheres and we all have studied it. That's not the only brain you have at all. What they say is wherever you have neurons, you have the capability of thinking and relaying energy. Neuron centers in the brain are connected to what they call glia cells. Glia cells are connected to what they call axons. Axons are connected to dendrite and dendrite stems are like conjunction boxes or what they want to call the uh, junction boxes for electricity. They run from one neuron center to the other. All that simply means is you have a place like a computer that can think and process thoughts. 
then it has a coaxial cable that gives it the energy. Depending on what kind of energy comes through there, the computer generates more energy. The neuron center can generate more thought. Then, based on how many programs you have in that neuron center, how many programs you have for that computer, the computer can be smarter or dumber. And then once it kicks in, it's joined, just like with the cable, to other computers or other neuron centers. So the whole key is this. The neuron, wherever it is found, is capable of generating or processing thought. That's all you have to know. And if you doubt me, go look up in your physiology books to tonight, come out tomorrow, and we'll talk about it. If you understand and agree with me, let us move on. Anywhere you have a neuron that is linked to other neurons or to the spine, or to nerve centers, that means that neuron can function. What is a neuron supposed to do? Generate and process thoughts, coming and going. You have a collection of neurons up and down your spine, and in certain pockets throughout the body, one of which is what is called the solar plexus. And just a little bit below it, above the spleen and above the navel, you will have a neuron center. That, I claim, is your animal brain location. That is why in the Oriental philosophy, in the Yoruba philosophy, even amongst the ancient Zulus, concentration upon the solar plexus with energies coming in either from the moon or the sun will turn a person more like into an animal than before. You can act like an animal and still be human because you are an animal person. Most of your ideas of survival, hunger, fear, fighting, come generated from that selection of neurons at the solar plexus. They do not come from that up here in the skull. In fact, you will find when you get really uptight, what does it say? My stomach got in knots, I couldn't talk, I just felt pain here and I was all uptight. That is your animal brain talking, taking over to fight or flight, to fear or love, to hate or to detest. These are all animal passions, and that's why they call them. These are the emotional hubs. They say that we use less than 1% of our brain. I sometimes even question that amount. The reason why we don't is because we are usually ruled by the animal body and animal brain, which has got so used to dominating man that now man is more animal in many cases than, what can I say, some of the animals. Some of the animals will not kill in the way man will now kill, or human will kill. Animals in general will fight to a point where one gives up, turns belly up, and the animal growls, postures, and walks away. Man will blow you away, human will blow you away now for no reason at all. We have become more animals. And therefore, those sections of our neuron centers work better than the one up here. So much here, this thing up here has nothing to do with getting rusty. It gets a lot of mucus around it. Its ends burn out and it won't fire correctly. You begin to really try to use it, you get a headache. You use it even more, you begin to get boils and breakouts because the energy has to drive out the pus and stuff that is coagulating the machinery. We don't use it. And there has been a lot of interest to stop us from using it, especially those of the sons of God and their offspring. Why? Because mankind and human was taught by mankind that if ever the sons of God would awaken to the power of using the upper brain power, they would become so devastating, so frighteningly auspicious that everything on earth would tremble at the power of this latent god and giant now asleep. That's why they've never told you the proper use of the brain and they will tell you again also that the pineal gland is an atrophied, non-usable tissue and organ that used to function but now has no bearing. That's another one of the biggest lies ever told. The pineal gland generates melanin and melatonin it works best between the hours of 11 at night and 2 in the morning when most of you should be asleep or in total darkness. It does not like light during the time it is regenerating. And that is also when most of the sons of God will find that three days out of the month 
or either in the evening or daytime, you have to find out whether you are a solar being or a moon frequency being. I know you don't know what I mean yet. Keep coming and we'll talk. That means at that time, the hole at the roof of your mouth will begin to let out air. It will begin to generate a little bubbling sound. Some of us have not even understood when this happens. It usually has a pattern and as you become more and more conscious of it and do things to increase it, it will open up more and more. How many of you, now don't lie about it, share with me, I'd like to see again the consciousness here. Men, because they say women, you don't have this privilege or this curse, whichever. Your day is tomorrow. Men have found that sometimes they seem to feel air or bubbling at the roof of their mouth in the area I just had you to try and trace with your tongue. How many have noticed it sometimes active but you never knew when it was? Just two, three, four, some of you are thinking about it. And the officer said, boy, what was that? And it sounded like a little bubbling sound. Sometimes it might even go on for 30 seconds, which is very frightening. You say, what the heck was that? That is our king's chamber and the grand gallery leading to that, sorry about that, leading to that passageway, trying to again work, trying to energize itself. Something you did kicked it in a little bit. I state through meditation, I straight through honoring the pineal gland by sleeping during those hours. You don't even have to sleep much past that if you can get good sleep during that time. It will increase the degree and vibration of the melatonin that you have in your body, increase your psychic power, so-called, your sense of ESP, and your health will increase. Once more, as when the sons of God came here and committed the atrocity that lowered the potential of man, and yet it was a blessing because it gave a seed and a spark to mankind that he could never have had otherwise. So it was both a curse and a benefit. When they came here, our planet was surrounded by an electric, I'm sorry, a magnetic field. That magnetic field cloaked out gamma rays and other what they call cosmic rays from coming into our planet and disrupting the life progression that was on the surface of our planet. The same Lord Gods then came and set up an electrical field inside that magnetic field causing everything to slow down. Now they refer to it as Earth's electromagnetic field are simply the Van Allen radiation belt. It is full of negative radiation just like an atomic bomb or Chernobyl was full of negative radiation which is harmful to grazing consciousness, to getting in the higher vibrations once more into our earth. It was put up there as a frequency barrier by purpose by Lord Gods who for a time sought to dominate this planet and tried to misuse again the seed of the angels who had committed adultery here, but also had given a soul a chance to migrate and prog progress here in a form that normally was not used. Let me simply break it down by saying this. For close to five million years, the sons of God have degenerated on this planet. Their souls have come and gone in bodies, never opening up to what and who they really were only from time to time getting a little light into what they potentially were supposed to be. Once they were not able to call on directly the universal cosmic creator, they had to then accept false gods and false teachings by mankind who was put upon the earth later on by others to keep this son of God in control. From greatness and grandeur, having the bloodline of the angels, they also had the higher frequency body potential of the angels. But now it was locked in an animal body and could only escape between the hours of 11 and the 2 in the morning when the pineal gland could kick in and they could come out of these false bodies and become what they really were. That's why people who dream in black and white are on the verge of ascending. People who dream in color and remember the dreams and have dreams that come in threes are prophets. And as it moves up again, they can begin to awaken and come outside of your body, look down upon your body and see that you are more than the body because you never were human. You were simply encased in human and locked in by the frequency barrier and you didn't know who you were. Trapped on a planet who you didn't even come from, 
were only here for a lesson, the lesson has got to go on and on and on infinitum, or even the planet is getting tired of that now and is changing the frequency. What we are about the business now is awakening. As you watch the stars, you will see, and if some of you are very much into celestial mechanics, into astrology or astronomy, you will find that the constellations are not in the proximity that they were even back in 1975. They have been displaced. You will find that due to what is called the progression of the equinoxes, even the signs by which you think you were born under no longer are the signs that rule you. They are not your natal ruling signs because they have now changed 30 degrees. Time and frequencies are speeding up. Some of you should have noticed that the days are flying by. The time seems to just slip by. That's for you who are matching vibrations. You become quick and sometimes agitated, sometimes searching for what you don't even know you're searching for, but you know something is changing while other soulless creatures say time is still the same. It is not the same. Time is frequencying upward. It's speeding up. You must also speed up, and to do so, you must awaken those glands that can cause your body to keep up with your soul. And it means you will be mutating. Don't become frightened of mutation. Sometimes if everybody mutates, nobody notices. The first mutation will be of the soul progression, and your neuron centers will begin to clean up their act. That's why head colds will be the rule. That's why asthma will be the rule, asthmatic conditions will be the rule as you try to clean off the mucus and burn it up. The more you use your brain, the faster it will be burned up, and the more you get the headaches, and the headaches will go away because you'll finally begin the frequency like you're supposed to. For those who can't, does not then feel disrespected by the other gender. The male and female supposedly now are equal and therefore have the equal rights which supposedly they had anyway. We have homosexuality and lesbians hitting man below his sexual belt and in fact threatening his very masculinity. We have drugs that are turning man into a weakling. We also have stress that's turning him into a nervous wreck and poor food intakes again and turning him into a very unfertile, very impotent, very frustrated shell of his former self. We're finding that man now dies much earlier than woman, that man again seems to get diseases faster than woman, that he's more subject to heart attacks, more subject to ulcers and to diabetes, to hair loss, and again to many of the ravages of old age which it shows on a man faster than it does now on a woman. So the question must finally be raised, can man in his present state actually uh, survive. Now, outside of that, when we look at the black man, in addition to all of those stresses, now must come the stress of a society which in the main is quite male dominated and oppresses the black male at every turn. We could go into a long lecture here about male-female relationships and about white man yellow man, brown man, and black man relationships, but I want to move past all of that. This may come up down the line as we hopefully meet together through the year, per se, but I want to go back to it by these scholars as Lord God. This was taken from what is called the Tetragrammation YVHV, or yad heh the Hebrew word Yehovah was interpreted again as God and Jehovah or Yehovah simply meant past, present, and future. Now this was done by what they call the scholars who were known as the Masorites or the writer scribes again. These were supposedly as we understand now Hebrew scholars and scribes interpreting what is called oriental philosophy for which was called now the chosen or chosen people which were there and for to come. So this was like a study guide for these so-called chosen by the scribes which were born before them. These Masoretes wrote what was called the Masoretic text of that chapter in that book literally was a universally created self-contained, parthenogenic, 
person, hopefully of higher consciousness, that God created that was called man. Parthenogenic simply means dual sexed, able to reproduce self without the aid of sperm and egg. It means a self-contained individual which obviously was either a very higher vibrating person at this time or pretty much we might say parthenogenic things were being placed on earth at that time which we don't find now. How many have ever heard of the Parthenon? I can take a look at the book and a passage from that book that made man supposedly the dominant creature on earth and what it was said but I want to look at it from a metaphysical point of view. I want to kind of tear it apart a little bit, maybe being a little bit sacrilegious if necessary, but still trying to keep the text involved to see if we can maybe look at this thing and reach a different conclusion. In Genesis, the first chapter, 26 verse, God is made to say, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over, and it goes on to say, the various creatures that fly and crawl and so on again like this. In Genesis, the 26th verse, it says again, So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him, male and female. Now, what do we have here? We have a God creating a male and a female at the same time and calling them mutually man. Later, a Lord God created another man and called him Adam. And this is where the trouble really begins to start and what the modern theologists and preferably the theosophists are calling the second creation or the second Adam or what I like to colloquially call Adam II. The Hebrew word for Adam means red clay when literally translated. It shows that Adamic man was formed physically from earth-bound ingredients and was somewhat red in appearance. The Hebrew word Yahweh was interpreted We also know that in defining things, if you don't begin at the beginning, it's very hard to reach the same conclusion. So I want to start with a subject that everyone should know about, man. Women love men sometimes. Men love men sometimes, and everybody knows about man in general. But I start usually at the beginning, and in so doing, I looked up a little bit about man again, and it simply said that man is an adult male human being. It also said then that a boy is a male child before he becomes a man. And then it was interesting, I found that at one time the word girl really meant boy. And that was amongst what they call Anglo-Saxon people as they were beginning to define their gender. The word girl actually meant boy at one time. I then looked up the word patriarch and it said it means a father or the male head of a family or a tribe. And, of course, it gave examples, and in the Christian Bible, I simply use that because this is where a lot of my people seem to point their references again. It stated that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were examples of patriarchs. I appreciate that. We presently live in, and for some time have lived under what we call a patriarchal or male ruled society. Most of the presidents of the country in which we serve have been male, and most of the things have been run by males. Maybe that's why it's in the condition it's in. The Bible says, and again I'm going back to the book that most of us feel we understand probably better than other books, whether we do or not, we'll have to actually see. And it says that Adam was the first man, and that the Lord God created what he placed under him, which was called Adam. He said that Adam was put in a seemingly tropical paradise, and because he might become lonely, he made for him other animals, and then finally a helpmeet, who was known as woman. 
Now, because of this emphasis on man by the Lord God, many religious and also uh, nations, again, throughout this planet, venerate man. They also say that the church has specific interest in the divine right of man because he was said to be the ruler of all things and said to dominate all things that were made for him put under his jurisdiction. But something's happened in our society. In our world today, there is much debate whether that something is good or that something is bad. Suddenly, there is what we call a male man and instead we now have a male person or a letter carrier. Instead of the chairman, we have a chair person. Instead of a congressman, we have a what? A representative or a congressperson. Mankind is now human being. Policeman is an officer of the law and so on and so forth it goes. This is so that one gender 